actors and writers and all. And therefore, they should be happy uh, and not want too much say, control of their own material. Within these purples, you may see such famous stars as the Marx Brothers, Chevalier, Harold Lombard, Richard Allen, May West, Harry Grant, and many of your other favorites. Over here on your right, playing hide and seek are Gary Cooper and Frederick Marsh. Hi there, boys! Of all studio personnel, it was the stars who were the most valuable asset to the companies in their fight for the public's attention, loyalty, and money. Their popularity guaranteed studio success, and so they were tied to companies with exclusive contracts. No one understood star power more than Paramount's founder, Adolf Zukor. As early as 1912, Zukor had had success with the film Queen Elizabeth, starring Sarah Bernhardt. Convinced there was a market for films featuring stars of the stage, Zucker had formed the famous Players Company, based in New York, pioneering the production of feature films with established star names. Every studio built its, not only its production schedule, but its entire production operation around uh, anywhere from two or three, say in the case of Universal or Columbia, to uh, 12, 15, 20, in the case of Paramount or MGM, stars. You're Norma Desmond. Used to be in silent pictures, used to be big. I am big. It's the picture that got small. The Warners had to produce so many Cagneys and so many Robinsons and so many Betty Davises that MGM had to produce, you know, and so on and so forth. A kind of unity between star and genre tended to develop. And this is marketing, this is good marketing. All that noise! Hey! You see, Mr. DeMille? Open the gate. Mr. DeMille shooting. You got an appointment? No appointment necessary. Every star was a virtual genre unto him or herself. And this obviously is heavily oriented toward the contract system and toward these kind of long-term contracts that the major stars would sign. Where's Mr. DeMille shooting? Stage 18, Mr. Desmond. Thank you, Jonesy. And teach your friends some manners. Tell them without me, you wouldn't have any job, because without me, there wouldn't be any Paramount studio. You're right, Miss Desmond. Go on, Max. The studios would loan their actors back and forth, but that was just like trading in grain futures, you know. The actors were, as I understand it, largely uh, properties then, and treated as such, though very deferentially and lived marvelously. That was really very good indeed. You think so? It was absolutely terrific. It was really wonderful. It was shit. There we go again, Billy. It was false. Didn't you notice? I want to do it again. You'll never do it better. I'm ready. Chief? Let's do it again. Do it We're again. gonna do it again. Bitch. The studio system gave more people more turns at bat, and more chances to play. Because you worked for one studio, and they made a lot more movies. And if by chance you made one that was lousy, by the time they figured out how lousy it was, you'd already made two more anyway. And remember, darling, I don't work before 10 in the morning and never after 4.30 in the afternoon. The struggle between creative individuals and a strict studio system was also very evident in the case of the contract studio director. Nice. Say, honey, could you put that other hand up around your throat? Here, only talent guaranteed a degree of freedom from interference by the studio boss. As Harry Cohn said, I get five guys I trust, and I don't talk to them when they're making the movie. And uh, he said, the other guys, I tell them exactly what to do or I throw them out. At the B level, the emphasis is on genre and formula. And, and it's without question, the emphasis is on, is on efficiency, just turning out the product like sausages. When dealing with top talent, you're dealing with people who have a certain notion of, of their role in the process. And they're aware that they're producing top product. And um, there was a lot of very creative conflict and negotiation that went on, particularly above the line, particularly involving producer, writer, director, star. Mr. Von Elstein, am I to understand that you consider this scene complete? I do. Well, I don't. You call that directing? That is what I've been calling it for 32 years. To be a director, you must have imagination. Whose imagination, Mr. Shields? Yours or mine? It will be done your way, but not by me, and not by any other director who respects himself. Howard Hawks had the greatest technique. 
if a producer came on the set, he would simply uh, say to the prop man, hey, come on, bring a chair over here. And he'd say to the producer, come on, sit down, let's chat. And everybody else would go off the set. And the producer would talk, and in about five or 10 minutes, he'd realize that nobody was working. And he would also realize that nobody would, would be working until he left. And so sooner or later, he'd say, well, wasn't I talking to you? And he'd get up and go. Without question, there were uh, any number of individuals, if we can go back to, you know, kind of von Stroheim and work our way up, and we can run out that litany of, of filmmakers who were done in by the constraints of the, this dehumanizing, highly industrialized, uh, profit-motivated system. But um, the, the more I look at it, the more I, I tend to see the system as, as enabling as it was constraining. You know, whoever supplies the money is the enemy. The studio's no different. There's always that tension. Uh, listen, on The Godfather, I'd go up to Francis uh, Coppola and I'd say, you know, this picture, Bob Evans and I have been discussing it. We need another action scene. We need the toll booth murders. Francis didn't want to shoot that scene. He said, look, I don't want to go over budget. If I shoot that toll booth scene, I'm going to go way over budget. It's bad for the studio. I said, Francis, you know, forget about the goddamn studio. Shoot the scene. Picture needs to be opened up a bit. Just shoot it and shut up. I think out of that tension, comes better movies. Ruthless, conservative, tyrannical, even vulgar, the studio boss was the father figure of the system, sometimes possessed by an uncanny intuition for mass taste and a tireless devotion to studio production. However, the Paramount lot, unlike its competitors, had no such figure. Rapid turnover of studio chiefs in the 30s meant that a degree of control was left to its strong roster of highly successful directors. Paramount's reliance on its essential creators led to German filmmaker Ernst Lubitsch taking over all studio operations in the mid-30s. I think it's an artist's studio in the 30s in a way that, that no other studio is. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that two of the founders of what eventually became Paramount, Jesse Lasky and Cecil B. DeMille, were both filmmakers. There was a tremendous amount of creative responsibility that was given to people like Sternberg in the 40s to people like Lubitsch and later Billy Wilder, Preston Sturgis in the early 40s. But these were individuals who uh, had a tremendous amount of control over their careers, relatively speaking. It built production units around, say, Von Sternberg who did a, a series of movies with Marlena Dietrich and used, again, the same creative personnel on film after film. The studio system could do that, but when they found particularly uh, talented people who could work together, they put them together in a unit and said, okay, give us two mysteries a year, give us two musicals a year, give us four westerns a year. I think that a style then developed uh, for particular producers and directors, which is very difficult to duplicate today. The destruction in Europe caused by the Great War allowed the studios to internationalize their system. Paramount in particular established strong European ties in both Germany and France. Contract director Joseph von Sternberg discovered Marlene Dietrich in Germany while making The Blue Angel. The studio immediately signed her up for what were to be six movies with von Sternberg back on Hollywood soil in the early 1930s. Dietrich. She knew exactly how she wanted to be lit. She'd been lit by von Sternberg, and, uh, and she had gotten this certain kind of look from a high light coming down. And she knew exactly where she wanted that light up there. She's the only one that ever <laughs> asked me to change the light up there. She thought it would be better if I moved it that way or this way. Von Sternberg developed a kind of a lighting that was very, very interesting, and, and it was different from the, what other lighting was. And, 
it was important to, to change things. And at that time, German film was really the, the best, especially, I think, modern in that. They, they were way ahead. It's all the, these Germans, you know, Lubitsch and von Steinberg and Marlene Ditchik and, uh, you know, Billy Wilder, Fritz Lang, and uh, naturally I didn't start out working with them, I, just as a draftsman, you know, but it was, it was a great learning period. Quite literally, top executives from Paramount, and particularly Paramount Universal, would regularly go to Europe for what were perceived over there as talent raids. <laughs> is international. So tonight we find him looking at a European picture starring a young Hungarian girl, Francisca Gal. Stop the picture a minute, Dixie. Get me Budapest. She be, it's 5.30 in the morning in Budapest. You, you can't get that girl out of bed. And why not? Foreign operator. Get me Budapest. Miss Francisca Gal, G-A-A-L. And of course, we're not importing movies. What we're doing is importing the talent that develops in those other countries. Hello? Francisca Gal? This is Cecil B. DeMille in Hollywood, California. Who? Cecil B. DeMille, Paramount Director, speaking from Hollywood. Cecil B. DeMille? Oh, yes. We want you to come to America for a picture. I want a fine emotional actress for the part I have in mind. You'll have to leave in one week. One week? Oh, you Americans. <laughs> Styles and techniques are being imported and appropriated and transformed to accommodate uh, this particular industrial system. Superficially, it may have seemed as if the major American studios were simply operating as large factories, mass-producing dreams for expanding foreign markets. They were factories because uh, they manufactured things. And if I'd been in Detroit, I might have been an automobile salesman or a mechanic. But in this town, uh, they made movies. And everything in the town was connected with the movie business. It was a manufacturing system where they had parts that they could bring in, and the parts were actors and actresses. They were on staff. They were there. Uh, you had script writers, you had directors. They were there. And all you did was to put these together, like um, automated manufacturing in the 30s, just like Ford uh, or General Motors. But it really wasn't a factory system. A factory system makes the same product over and over and over again. Each Ford looks at like every other Ford. But with cinema, the problem is to make a sense of the assembly line for uh, motion pictures that will all be different. Unique combinations of stars and screenwriters and action and narrative. Uh, 